to praise God and to lift him up and rejoice. It's, it's something about praising God from your heart makes a difference. You can, you, can, you can get happy about some things, but to get happy about the Lord is a entirely different emotion. It's, just, it's not that kind of emotion that comes and goes. It's the kind of emotions that stick with you. Somebody see things going on in life and, and they look at you and they say, why are you so happy? Why are you smiling and why are you praising God? There's something about the joy of the Lord. They, 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 say, they say, it's my strength. It's my hope. Without that, I would be just as weak and just as frail as anything. But it's because of that joy that carries me through those rough times, those tough times. It causes me to overlook the circumstances that are going on in my life because if, if, I, if I could just have that joy, that joy that's beyond understanding, we can't put it in words because sometimes I can't explain to you why I'm so happy. I should be mad. I should be upset. I should be disappointed, downhearted. But, but when you think about it, it is not coming from me. It's coming from the Lord. He said, I give you a joy that's not of this world. Huh? It's outside this world. It's not what the world calls joy, but it's a joy that's heaven sent. <laughs> God, grace is in life. I got a part of heaven in me. And don't nobody even know about it. They can't understand why. But it's outside this world. So we thank God for devotion, services. We thank God for all these peoples. We ask you, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of St. John. In the 15th chapter of St. John, we're going to read from the 18th verse down to the 25th verse. St. John, the 15th chapter. 18th to the 25th verse. If you have your programs, it's inside your programs. We'll ask you to stand for the reading of God's Word. And it reads, It says, If the world hates you, it says, You know that it hated me before it hated you. It says, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world 
hateth you. Remember the words that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my sins, they will keep your sins. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sins. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now, but now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this comes to pass that the words might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Amen. Thank the Lord. Name standing for word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for this moment and for this hour, Lord, to be used as an instrument in your hand and unto your glory and unto your praise. Lord, open unto us words of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Let your word go forth. Let it edify, let it build up, let it convict, Father, let it save. We pray we ask this all in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for what we're going to receive in Jesus' name. And let the church say, Amen. Today we'll be speaking about hatred without a cause. We give honor to the Spirit of Christ, to everyone in their respectable places. We thank God for you being here today. When we think about the relationship between the true believer and the world, Jesus gives us a, a bleak picture. It's not glorious, it's not happy, it's not rejoicing. He wants the true believer to know this and to know it soundly. He said, the world hates you. The world and its people will shun you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. And they're going to even consider you a strange person to be around. I'm talking about genuine, true believers of God. And sometimes it goes so far as they even kill God's people because of their relationship with Jesus Christ. So Jesus, I want you all to know, I want to inform you all, I, want, I don't want you all to be shocked, I don't want you all to be surprised because you got saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Everybody don't like you. He said, no, I'm, 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 I'm going to put it wrong, I'm going to put it straight. They're going to hate your guts. And the bad part about it is, is that he doesn't give a justifiable reason for it. You know, hatred is sometimes hard to see in individuals. Some things you can see and some things you can't see. Thinking about some of the things that uh, David wrote in the Psalms. He wrote in Psalms 35 and 19, he said, he said, let them not rejoice over me who wrongfully, who are wrongfully my enemies. He said, Lord, let them wink with the eyes who hate me without a cause. They would say, when they come to see me in my sick bed, he said, they don't really come to see me to see how I'm doing. He said, they come to see me to see if I'm going to really die. They want that, whatever I have, to kill me. He said, they come and they come to say, how you doing, fella? And I hope you get better. But when they leave, he said, they start laughing and mocking. He said, oh, brother, what he got, it's going to kill him. It's going to take him out of here. And we hope he die. These are his so-called friends. They say, if it had been a friend, he said, I could have understood it. I mean, if it was the enemy, he said, I, I could have understood it. Because you can understand the hatred of your enemy. But you cannot understand those who are supposed to love you, their hatred for you. You feel like, if anybody's going to love me, my friends are going to love me. If anybody's going to stick with me, it's my best buddies. They're gonna, if anybody's going to talk up for me, it's going to be with friends. 
But they were saying, he said, but you know, he said, if it hadn't been the enemies, I would have understood, but he said, but it wasn't my f familiar friend. He said, we ate bread together, went to church together, we worshiped together, we did all these things together. He said, now him, that fellow, who we, we walked together and talked together, that fellow, the raised up his heels against me. You can understand hatred from people you've done wrong. <laughs> you can understand hatred from the enemy, but you cannot understand hatred from a friend, supposedly a friend. And so what Jesus was trying to teach us is this here. That's the thing that's going to happen to you as a believer in Christ. He said, I don't want you to be shocked about. He said, I don't want you to think that in your home is going to be peace, love, and happiness. He said, I'm going to bring a sword there. He said, mother going to be against daughter, daughter going to be against uh, mother, father against son, huh? children against parents. He said, they're going to turn you in on credit. Give me a dime and I'll turn your mama in. Huh? And all these things, he said, they're going to do it. They can make doing me a favor. So when you begin to think about hatred, Jesus said, I don't want you, because, you know, as Christians, we are shocked about some of the things that people do to us. We really don't believe we deserve to be laid off when there's a fellow on the job cussing, lying, drinking, doing everything. And he still got a job. What kind of God you serve? First question comes down mind. We think about the woman's son down the road. He's the worst. Yet your son caught the disease. And we sometimes we God said, I don't want you to be shocked about the things of the world and how the world is going to treat you. And when so many of us as God's believers try to be friends with the world. No, no, we don't want the world to isolate us. We sometimes we even afraid to tell people we save. No, nobody put that go on me. Don't put that hell on my head. I'm just like y'all. Try to talk their language. Try to act like them. Go to the things hey, that they go to. Because you don't want nobody to know you are a true believer. I want you to know something. All that that you do, they still going to reject you. You can't mix all with water. I don't care how hot you stir it, boil it, or whatever. You can't mix all with water. Jesus is trying to tell you, you might want to be a part of them, but they don't want you. They'll soon figure you out because ain't no way in the world you got God's spirit in you and the devil's spirit in them, and y'all can walk along together and agree. It won't happen. So why are you trying to be friends with them? Why are you trying to be like them? When Jesus said, they hate you. And they really do. And they will do whatever they can to put you out of service. You know, I've learned in my Christian life, in the years I've been saved, not to be surprised by what people will do to you. Don't be shocked. I've seen things happen that I thought would never happen and yet it did. And I, the reason I thought that it would never happen because I put these situations on a pinnacle and I say, friends like that will never separate. And I look around and I see they hate each other. You think that because you figure it will always be like that. I found out something about the world. Everything in it is temporary. I don't care what it is, relationships, I don't care what it is, contracts, I don't care, it's all temporary. All that you can allow on is those spiritual issues that God has promised us. Yeah. Now, if you put all your hope in what God has promised us, that's eternal. But when you start putting all your hope in what the world says and the things of the world, I look at all these talk shows and these people going to the field and these people going to the office and everything, and they're going to all these different ones trying to get their problems solved. I want to hear something. That is only a temporary fix. God got the real fix for our problems. And so Jesus, we're going to get into this. He said, if the world hates you, he said, I want to let you know something. If the world hates you, he said, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Now, he want to tell us three things here. First thing he said, it's not if 
He says, since the world hates you, because there's no question about the world hating you. The world hates you. He says in Matthew 5, 11, says, Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say, All men of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. I like that word falsely. Long as it's a lie, it's a lie. But if it's the truth, then they got the right to persecute you. But if he's saying these things and it's not true, then Jesus says, You are blessed. Then he says in Matthew 10 and 22, he says, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Can you endure people's isolate themselves from you? Can you endure people's talking about you falsely? Can you endure people's counting you as an enemy? They don't want to have nothing to do. Can you endure that? He said, he said uh, they going to hate you for my name's sake. But can you endure that? Can you go through that? And then he says something else. He says, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And that's Philippians 1 and 29. Have you ever thought that you volunteered to be persecuted when you accepted Jesus? Did you ever think that you volunteered for people to talk about you and run your name down? Did you ever think about that when you say, I'm a child of God, I believe you, Lord, I love you, Lord? He said, it's given you. You signed the contract. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to be talked about for his name's sake. And then it says in 2 Timothy 3 and 12, he said, yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So Jesus, I want you to know the world, those who don't believe in me, those who don't trust me, I want you to know that they are going to hate you. But he said, but I want you to know too, the world, the world, what do the world stand for? And everything that the world look out for. He said, I want you to know the world has three things that they really enjoy. He said, all that's in the world, he says, is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, the world cares about food, the world cares about clothes, the world cares about money and immorality, huh? He said, the lust of the eyes, the world cares about the evil and moral thoughts, the coveting and seeing and desiring things in the peoples. And then he said, I want you to think about the other thing about the world, the pride of life. The world like positions, they like fame, they like self-centeredness, they like boasting, they like high mind. He said, all those things of the world. And he said, if you love the world, then he said, the love of the Father is not in you. He said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, he said, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. There's something about what the world loves and what God's people love that's supposed to be such a great difference that people can tell that you are not of this world. That should be such a difference because he said that the world has a lust of the flesh. He said the world has a pride of life. He said the world has a lust of He said what they seek after, what brings them honor, what, what gives them joy, it shouldn't be the same as a thing for you as a child of God. And so he said, I want you to know this too. He said, the world hates you. But he said, but I want you to know that it hated me before it hated you. Huh? That's all right if you hate me. But the fact of the matter is, if you hate my daddy before you hated me, brother, it's all right. That means you don't like the family. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you don't like my daddy. You don't like my daddy, son. You don't like my daddy's family. So how are you going to sit around and say that? Jesus, I want you to know they hate you because first they hated me. He said, the thing is, this is, is that we ought to know that Jesus was first hated. And he said in John, 1 John 3, 13, he said, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Huh? Don't be discouraged. Don't be uh, uh, ashamed. Don't feel disappointed because your friends gonna leave you. I had a whole we used to call our we had our little group in school and call ourselves the animals. Each one of them had names. We had bear, we had weasel, huh? We had groundhog, huh? Our whole gang had names, you know what I'm saying? I ain't gonna tell you about mine. <laughs> but we all had names. Huh? And the thing is, is that I 
thought that those brothers would be with me until I die. Because we were buddies from elementary, high school, we were friends. Even after we got out of school, we keep in contact. But one, slowly after I got saved, they say, well, we ain't see you in the clubs no more. We ain't see you around the favorite hangout spots. Everybody thought you had to die. I said, no, I got saved. They said, what? I said, yeah, I, I, I got saved. I guess that name that y'all gave me, which was a name, I definitely don't want to take over in salvation. <laughs> but <laughs> that name y'all gave me, I ain't, I'm not that no more. Huh? I, I, don't, I don't live that way. I don't act that way no more. I done got saved. They thought I had lost my mind. They bust out laughing. They would have called all the other animals of the gang and told them what happened to me. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, boy, that was a joke. Man, they didn't see me. They said, man, I thought you was dead. I heard that you done got saved. Man, they just cracked up laughing, looking at me. All these who I thought was my friends, they, they left me like I was something strange. They got away from me. But Peter tells us, he said, don't, don't. Consider a strange thing, the fury trials and the things that's going to happen for you. People that you have been counting on when you was out there in the world, they're going to leave you. They're going to forsake you. They're going to turn their back to you. And some people can't take that. Some people want to hold on to their past and bring it to their future. And that, that's a, those are two different locations. And you can't bring one into the other. If you want to go farther, you got to leave what's behind behind. And you got to press towards what's in front of you. And a lot of times what's holding us up is that we want to bring the behind up to the front. And it don't work like that. You have to leave it where it is in order to get to where you're going. And a lot of times we can't leave behind those old things. The Bible says you are a new creature. The whole old things have passed away. The whole all things have become new. And when you, when you talk about something new, you talk about something that haven't happened before. Something that you haven't experienced before. Some things you haven't gone before. Some things that you haven't even taken place in. God said, I'm going to take you to a brand new state. You, you ain't going to act the same. You ain't going to think the same. You're not going to walk the same. He said, I'm going to bring you to a point where when people see you the next time, they're going to want to know, is that really you? You're going to live a life so different, so changed. And so the thing is, he said, I don't want you to be shocked. And then he says in verse 19, he said, if you are of the world, he said, the world would love his own. <clears throat> but because you are not of the world, but have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world, what? hates you. Now these next few verses, he's going he gonna to give us reasons why the world hates us. He said the first thing is because you're separate. That's something about the world in you that ain't the same. He said, I'm taking you out of the world. It's system. It's way of living. He said, I'm taking you out of that and I've chosen you for myself. He said, because I have taken you out of the world, he said, the world hates you. You've been removed from its environment. In other words, ain't nobody happy in the drug house when you're in front of a whole bunch of polices. They feel like polices ain't got no business being in the drug house. And so everybody's uncomfortable seeing the police in the drug house. But you see, if the police wasn't in the drug house, and everybody there was the same, everybody would be what? Comfortable. When you're a thief and you just stole something, and the police car pull up beside you, and he ain't really looking for you, but you just stole something and you got something, you're nervous. Because you think he after you. But uh, if it's just one of your friends, your fellow thieves, you're comfortable. You see, the world is comfortable around its own. That's what he's saying. As long as you like me, and we can talk that same slang, do the same thing, act the same way, I'm comfortable with you. But don't bring no, no priest to the body. Please don't bring no pastor. 
we gonna get down. We gonna have a good time. Then your pastor come showing up. Guess what? People start changing. <gasps> Ooh, they go Ella Bull. <laughs> now you know been laughing, drinking, cussing, and all that, but Ella Bull walking into the house, everything got uncomfortable. You was in your world. She was saying what? I took you out of your world. And when I took you out of your world, you ain't gonna be comfortable no more. He said, they hate you now because now you're what? What do people see when they see a pastor coming into a, 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 a what do they call it, what do they call orgy parties? What do you think people just think of a pastor walking up in there? Would they be comfortable? Or everybody go try to find their clothes? <laughs> they gonna try to figure out, right off the bat, they gonna be uncomfortable. Right off the bat, everybody gonna be looking for their clothes. You understand what I'm saying? And so, and you look at these people looking at me, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. But he said, I have taken you out of that environment. I can't run with the animals no more. I know what all them boys are about. And I can't run with them no more. They, they ain't going to be comfortable, man, especially now that I'm a pastor. They ain't going to be comfortable running with me because I know what they're running after. I know what they're doing. And see, God took me out of that environment. He's taking you out of that environment. And he said, because he's taking you out of that environment, the world is going to what? Hate you. He said, I'm taking you out of that environment. I've called you out of the world. You are no more, understand what I'm saying. You are no more of the world. I, I want to, you know, God was telling me something. He said, he said, you need to remind the peoples that the world hates them. You need to remind the people that they are no more of the world. Stop trying to go back out there into the world. You don't belong there. They don't want you there. They're going to do everything they can to kill you while you're out there. He said, I want you to know this. Don't, be, don't even have it in your heart to go back where you came from. Hate it as much as it hates you. And then he said in verse 20, he said, Remember the words that I said unto you. He said, the servant is not greater than his Lord. He said, if they have persecuted me, he said, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, he said, they will keep yours also. Now, if they persecuted Jesus, and he's your Lord and Master, what make you think they're not going to persecute you? He said, the servant is not above persecution. And no servant is above his law. He said, if they did it to me, guess what? They're going to do it to you. We are his. What he stands for is what we stand for. And whatever that was about him that caused men to persecute him, the same thing is in us. <laughs> and they will persecute us for the same thing and for the same reason. If you got the same thing Jesus got, if you're walking in the same world Jesus is walking in, and they persecuted him, what make you think you're going to get by? I'm going to tell you something. Long before, back, I say back in the early 60s, when we was marching, I didn't even, you, you didn't even have to know the peoples. All you had to do was have this color. And when you had this color, they associated you with everything that went with that color. Jesus say, just like they associated the blacks, they will associate you as a Christian because you are Christ-like. And the thing that hate, they hated about him was the same thing that's in you today. You got the same anointing upon your life. You serve the same God that he served. You believe the same thing that he believed. You, you teach the same thing that he teach. And you stand for the same thing that he stands for. And he said, if you do all the same things that I do, he said, they're going to persecute you just like they persecuted me. We are all the same. You know what? I don't, I, some people are ashamed to say, I'm, I'm just like Jesus. Some people are ashamed to say, I believe in Jesus. Some people are ashamed to say, I love this life. But if you are like he was, then don't expect the world to treat you any different than they treated him. Because you're standing for the same things that he stood for. 
And I want to tell you, I'm proud to stand for the same things that Jesus stood for. I'm not ashamed to raise his name, talk about his name, praise his name, tell anybody about his name, tell anybody I love Jesus. I'm not ashamed. And if that causes you to hate me, then that's fine with me. Huh? I, I'm glad to be in the boat with him. Huh? And if you're going along without any persecution, without anybody hating you, I wonder if you're standing for the same thing that he stood for. And then look at verse 21. It said, but all these things will endure to you for my name's sake, because they know not him who sent me. Now, another reason the world is going to hate you is because they really don't know God. The world is deceived in their beliefs about God. The world thinks God is the Santa Claus. They think that well, all you need, God got it, he'll give it to you. And that's the only thing you need God for. It's just for your grits and eggs, ham and bacon. But God is your Savior. He's your Lord. Huh? He's the one who forgives you of your sins. He's the one who washed your sins away and placed his spirit inside. The world is looking for material things when God is offering spiritual things. The world is looking for things that, that's just for the moment, right now, fulfillment. When God is giving you something that's going to last forever. The thing is about this here is that the peoples who claim to know God do more evil to God's people than anyone. Jesus said this here in John 16, 2 and 3, he said, he said they shall put you out of the synagogue. Yet the time cometh that whosoever kills you will think that he's doing God's service. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. You see, when folks don't know God, they don't know you. And you see, the, the, the fact of that is, you can't know God and not know Jesus. You can go around and say, all the gods you want to call it, all the names you want to call it, but until you know Jesus, you don't know God. And the reason they don't know God is because they don't know Jesus. And if they don't know Jesus, they don't know who you are. The demon told the sons of Seneca, he said, look, he said, I know Paul. Why do we know Paul? Because Paul know Jesus, and Jesus know Paul. And says that, the demon said, I know Paul. But he said, but I don't know you. Why he didn't know them? Because they didn't know Jesus. And if you know don't know Jesus, the devil don't recognize you. You ain't nobody but his servant. But when you go on Jesus' side, your name is written on the devil board. He said, look, I got his name up here. He's a servant of the most high God. He will recognize you. You ain't got to worry about telling everybody you say. They'll know you say. You ain't got to worry about put a big old cross around your neck and tell somebody that you know Jesus. They'll know you know Jesus because your name, not only your name written in the last book of life, but your name is also written in the devil book of damnation because I'm going to try to put you in so much trouble and so much persecution. He trying to put out there, I'm going to say, Lord, just let me just have my hands and put my hands upon him. See, when you live right, the devil wants to make life hard for you. He wants to get you so to the point where you don't want to live for the Lord anymore. How many times have come into our lives? Things have been so severe, and circumstances have seemed so hard, that we thought that the Lord had forsaken us, and we thought the Lord had forgotten us today. We were just all out there by ourselves. But I want to tell you, I don't care what your circumstances look like, and how bad it may be, you are never alone. God is with you in the hole. He's with you in the trouble. He's with you in the storm. I don't care what's going on in your life. God hasn't forsaken you. The devil puts it in your mind. God left you. God didn't leave you. What are you thinking like that? He's still standing there. Yeah. Right with you. A lot of times he should leave us. But he just won't go. He just won't turn us loose. And I'm so glad he's like that. So so many people who I thought wouldn't let me go, they didn't let me go. But God said, no, I know you got problems. I know you got situations going on in your life. But I'm not going to let you go. He's always there because why we know if you, the, the more you know God the better life becomes for you so a lot of things we do because we don't know 
And you keep reading. Know this. Know that the world hates you. Know this. You're going to suffer persecution. Know this. They don't know me. Huh? And, the, and, the, and, the, and you know, when you begin to see people doing things against you, then you realize it's not him I'm fighting. It's not flesh and blood that's my real enemy. But it's the principality and the power and the thing that's in that body that's really fighting against me. Me and you ain't no problem. But it's what's in you and what's in me that can't get along. Because what's in you is not the same thing that's in me. And because of we're having a difference in our spirit, huh? we got a battle going on. And see, the thing is, this is a lot of times we get into a, a fleshly battle. We think it is, it's Mary. We think it's Jim. But it's not Jim and it's not Mary. It's a duality force influencing Jim, influencing Mary to try to get you to get out of your spirit and get with them and on their level. I ain't going to get on your level. God say, great is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I don't have to be brought down. Paul said in the book of Acts 17, 23, he said, as I passed by, the hell no devotion. He said, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom you therefore ignorantly worship and him declare unto you. It's because they don't know God is the reason they hate you. It's because they don't know God is the reason they treat you the way they do. It's because they don't know God and the thing they do in these things. Because they don't know God. And it's important that you know God. Because he's, Paul said, in him I live, I move, I have my being. Without him, I can't exist. But when you don't know God, you think it's you moving yourself. You think it's you waking yourself up. You think it's you doing it all. You see, the more we know about God, the more we'll become humble. The more we know about God, the more we'll be more dependent upon him because we'll know he's all I got. Huh? I ain't got nobody <clears throat> but God. As long as I got God, I'm never alone. You know, you feel alone. Sometimes. Sometimes you feel like you're all by yourself. But God always assures us in his word, you never alone. As long as I'm here, you're not, everybody can leave you, but I'm still here. You're never alone. You know, I, I hear single people say, you know, it's hard to, to live by yourself. It's hard to get alone. But you really ain't by yourself. And I believe this year, and I believe for a fact, if God felt like you was alone so bad, he'd go pull a rib out of somebody <laughs> and make you a helpmate. If he had to, huh? Because he said, Adam, it's not good for him to be alone what he did. When he got him somebody. God knows whether or not you really are alone. All right, that's all the things somebody said, well, Pastor, you got a wife. I said, yeah, I do have a wife. What's your wife? I, I thank God for my wife. But even married sometimes, you, you can feel alone. Don't ever think it. Sometimes you feel like, man, she don't, she don't care about me. She don't think nothing about me. Sometimes you can be in a house full of people, and you can still feel alone. Everybody will go by you, and everybody, ain't nobody saying, that. oh. So it ain't about who you're married to. It ain't about how many people's in the house. It's about who you got in your heart. If it's in your heart, you got the Lord in your heart. You got more companionship, more company than you'll ever need. Huh? Ain't, ain't no use running out there trying to find a, a Jesse James. Because there ain't none out there. Ain't no use running out looking for some boys. And I know y'all gonna y'all y'all see people looking for them bow ass money. He out there. But I'm here to tell you this here. What God got for you, he's gonna give it to you. You know what I'm saying? I I I I I hear your cries, and I, I, I hear your pain, but what you need is only gonna come from the Lord. And he will provide that thing that you need. I, I, I want you to be totally dependent upon God for whatever you need. I want you to depend on God for even your food in the morning, your clothes on your back. I want you to get to a point where you depend on God for waking you up in the morning. 
for carrying you through the day. When you get back home in the evening, I want you to thank the Lord for carrying me all through that day and bringing me back home safely. I don't want you to get to a point where you ever think it's you that's doing it. That's the way the world thinks. But you got to think where the Lord have brought you. Brother, look here. If it wasn't for the Lord, I could say a whole lot of things. And I'm pretty sure you could too. It wasn't for the Lord. Lord have mercy, man. I see all my friends. A lot of my friends are in prison. A lot of the animals are dead. But the fact of the matter is, God kept me. <laughs> and look at verse 22 and 23. He said, if I had not come and spoken unto them, and they had not sinned, but now they have no excuse, Secretary, for their sins. He said, he who hates me hates my father also. Now, boy, that, that's a strong statement. But Jesus said the world hates you because of the message that you bring. You see, Jesus preached and teached about righteousness and holiness. And nobody want to hear that. You want to make somebody mad, start telling them about righteousness and holiness. He said, they're going to hate you because of what I taught you. I taught you about righteousness. And I taught you about love, your enemies. Uh, I taught you about do good to those that despite for me, use you. He said, I, I, he said I, the words that I teach, he said, he said, they're not of this world. He said, they are spirit and they are life. And, and said, the world hates these words. You know, the, the worst thing you can tell somebody who want to do wrong is what to do right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He don't want to do what's right. He don't want to hear what you got to say. But Jesus said, I, 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 I exposed their sins. I told them about their wrongs. And I told them the things that they should do. And because I exposed those things to them, they got hot. And they got mad. So he said, the world hates you because of the words and the message that I spoke to them. Now he said, but had they not sinned. And now, you look at that when you read that scripture, you, you think about, he's talking about if they had not sinned, but the world was already in sin. He said, they have not had sin. But he said, but now they have no cloak for their sin. Now, you know, the, we couldn't have got it any better than God becoming a man and coming to live in the life that he wants you to live. Now, if he hadn't came as a man and lived the life that he wanted you to live, you could say to God, whoever did it. You can say to God, nobody is able to live a life like that. But now he said, if I had not come, he said, they had not sinned. But he said, but now they got no excuse for their sin. Because the Bible said, he was tempted in all points just like you are. He felt pain, he was hunger, he was threatened, he was persecuted, he was something he was talked about, he was beaten. He said, if, if I had not come, he said, you can have an excuse. You can say, God, who all did it? Brother, it's bad when the person who's teaching you have gone through the experience himself. And then you've got to tell him it can't be done. Because, brother, once you go through it, you say, yes, I know it can be done. And this is what he's saying. You can't sit up here and say, you can't live right now. You can't sit up here and say, you can't do what God said. You can't sit up here and say, you can't keep his word no more. Because why? he came and he proved that you could. And people always say that Jesus, but Jesus was a man. A man filled with the Holy Spirit just like you. When you become born again, God changes that old way, that old nature, and he put a new nature in you. A nature that desires him. A nature that desires to live right. A nature that desires to live holy. Before you never had those desires. You never thought about coming to church. You never thought about reading your Bible. You never thought about praying. You never thought about fasting. You never even thought about asking forgiveness for what you had done somebody wrong. But with that new nature, 
You desire to do things. I mean, things convict me now that used to never bother me. You ever felt that way? You used to do things and walk away. It didn't bother you. But now it bothers you. Because there's a new nature inside of you. When you tell a lie, now it hurts you. Man, I used to lie with the animals all the time. Lie, 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 lie. And it never bothered me. But now, you tell a lie, you can go, you can tell it, but it, it worries you. Start weighing on your mind. And you, you, you begin to say, I, I didn't mean it, Lord. I, 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 I was trying to get out of a situation, and the only thing I do is lie. And you try to make all kinds of reasons, but it keeps staying right with you. That's a new nature. See, if you don't know if God's changing, watch the things that's happening to you now. That used to didn't happen to you at all. God changes you. I, I, I never worried about going to church on Sunday. I never worry about reading my Bible. I never worry about praying. But it bothers me now. It gets on my heart now. You know, I don't know about you all, but it, it, if I don't hear these are words, it's going bother me. I, I got to have some word. You understand? And so God lets us know that his message and the thing that he did convicts the world. And then Jesus said this here. He says a bold statement. He said, he who hates me hates my father also. Ain't nowhere in the world you can hate Jesus and love God. It's just that simple. If you hate Jesus, if you can't stand Jesus, you can't stand God. Jesus put it on this turn. If you love my father, did you love me? But if you hate me, you hate my father. So Jesus told the Jews in the eighth chapter of St. John 19, he said, This is they are them, where is thy father? Jesus answered, You need to know me. Know my father. He said, when you had known me, you should have known my father also. The, the, the best description of God is to learn about Jesus. You learn the love of God, the patience of God, the power of God. You learn all the things about God through Jesus. Huh? You can't get to know God without first getting to know who Jesus is. And because of Jesus, the thing is, we get to know just who God is. God so loved the world, the Bible says, that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. Now, in verse 25, it says this here. He said, in verse 24, If I had not done among them the works, which none other man did, they had not sinned. But now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But he said, But this come to pass, that the words might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. E, I'm trying to figure out. You, it, 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 it's like something that you can't really, it's like a paradox. It's, it's not understandable. Why do the world hate Jesus? You ask yourself that question. You say, what did he do that caused them to hate him? Bible says he only came and did good. Huh? He healed the sick, he opened up the eyes of the blind, he raised the dead, he fed the hunger. He did all good things. He taught the truth. He taught about righteousness. Huh? He showed that he cared. He showed that he loved. So you ask yourself, why do the world hate Jesus? But the fact of the matter is the world is evil. And evil hate good. Is never in love with good. In order to get out of that evil, you got to come to Jesus. You might have a good heart, but if you're in the world, you're still evil. Until you come to God, all your works, what you call righteousness, the Bible says there are filthy rags. And then, Jesus said, this here, they hated me without a cause. They, they never went to the cross. He said, well, what fault did Pilate find in him? He was looking for it. The Jews were sending 
uh, liars to try to tell lies. They, they couldn't even get their lies together. Huh? They were trying to make up stuff on him. And they couldn't even make up stuff on him. And Paul was trying to find a, a reason to crucify Jesus. He said, you brought him to me, but he said, but well, what reason? He, this man has done no wrong. And yet and still, they wanted him crucified. He said, they hated me without a cause. I understand the hatred of my enemies. I understand the ones who will call themselves, I'm not your friend. I understand the way that they treat me. But he said, but the ones who I've fed, the ones who I've healed, the ones who I've brought back from the dead, the ones who I've done all these good things, he said, I can't understand the cause why they hate me. They don't have a reason. But he said, but only because of the scripture must be fulfilled. He said, they hated me without a cause. My mind goes back to Judas. And you think about Judas. He is, he's privileged to be amongst the twelve. He's privileged to hear Jesus' every word, to see his every miracle. He's privileged to sit down at the table and eat with Jesus. He's privileged to travel everywhere with Jesus. Huh? Huh? But the thing is, he wasn't, he said, what got into his heart to a point where he got to a point where he sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. You ask yourself, what did he do to Judas to make Judas stab him in the back like that? You don't need a cause a lot of times or reason to do evil. Sometimes it's just the devil getting inside of you. It's just the devil influencing you. You know, we can let the devil take some of us who are good, nice, righteous people. We can let the devil just get right in us and influence us to a point where we start doing things and people say, I ain't know you was like that. I'm sure everybody at the table thought everybody at the table had the same love. From Judas all the way up to Peter, we was all eating together. We was all traveling together. We was all pitching together. We was all running prayer meetings together. And I believe everybody at the table thought everybody loved Jesus. Jesus said, this night somebody is going to betray me. It was so Natural to the eyes themselves. They say, Is it I? Is it I? You know, I'm telling you now, if you're living in a way and you're talking in a way, I can hear you. I will now. I say, Well, people are always talking about him. I believe it's him. Or something they be, she always talking about him. I believe it's her. But Judas wasn't even talking about Jesus to a point where people would say he was Judas. Judas wasn't doing things against Jesus where people would say it was Judas. Nobody knew who he was because everybody. Everybody thought that everybody was friends. Everybody thought that everybody was one. But I'm here to tell you, if you open the door, if you allow him, the devil will step in. And he'll step in. And all that friendship and all that love that you have for one another, you let the devil step in. And he'll cause all kinds of fits and problems. And it'll be about nothing. You know what he was mad about? Because she Jesus took some uh, perfume that he said it should have been sold and given to the poor. It ain't nothing. He didn't heal all the sick. He didn't fed 5,000 people. What about a one bottle of perfume? But if you let the devil step into your life, he'll take some simple cause and he'll work that thing into you to a point where it gets to where you hate him. To a point where you get to where you deny him. To a point where you get to where you will turn your man. What's it no cause? How could you say he didn't care about the poor? When he was so concerned that 5,000 people, he said, I won't even send them home because I, I believe they're faint on the way. He said, you feed them. And they were so confused, they said, Lord, how can we feed them? We ain't got enough. He said, what you got? He said, we got two more fish and five loaves of bread. He said, give it to me. And he began to thank God. He began to break it. And he fed them to the full. He had every last one of them. How could you say what they say? You don't care nothing about the poor. 
so that when you let little things, the devil will only need just a crack in the door. And you let those little things work their way into your heart. Because the Bible says that when Jesus got up from the table, Jesus said, That what thou doest, do it quickly. And the Bible said he was speaking to Jews, and Jews knew what he was going to do. The Lord knows your heart. You can sit at the table, you can smile, you can jump up and down, but he knows your heart. Don't only do what you're going to do. And Judas got up and did it, went out and sold his friend. Then when he came to the garden with all the troops, come with knives and swords and spears, coming to get him like he was some kind of a rebel. Some kind of criminal. Here's your friend here. Leading the pack. Coming into the garden. And I, I'm so glad it's Jesus. Because I'd have told him so much when I ran into him. But Jesus, I want to show you how you deal with those who hate you. He don't say, Lord, hit him with a bolt of lightning. He don't say, Lord, open up the ground and let him fall in the hole. He reaches out and say, friend. And something about that word friend should have just shook him up. The worst thing you could do to somebody who totally hates you and don't want to see no good for you is to still call them friend. This is the kind of life that we as Christians are supposed to have. Because the Bible says, you hate those that hate you. Say, what, what, what's, what good is you? He didn't let nobody in the world. If you do good to them, that do good to you. He said, what thanks are you? He said, the world can do that. But when you love those who hate you, and you can speak well of those who tried to kill you, now you showing the Father's love. Now you showing the Father's character. You know, he's, he give us these things that we tell around hate these people in the world. He, he, he said none of that for that reason. He said, in fact, he says in the book of St. John, the 16th chapter, and look at the third second and third, third verse, he said, he said, indeed the hour is coming, yea, it has come. He said, you will be scattered, each his own, and will leave me alone, and yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. He said, but these things that I've spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. But he said, but be a good cheer. He said, well, I have overcome the world. The Bible calls us overcomers. The Bible said, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. I can always treat you nasty. I can always talk about you. I can always put you down. You know what I'm saying? Because you talked about me. Because you did me. I can always do that to you. But he said, but if you are out of the world, you're supposed to love them. You're supposed to do them right. You're not supposed to talk about them. You're not supposed to do them wrong because they beat you up. You're supposed to do them right. Isn't that hard to do when you got such an evil influence pushing you to talk about them, pushing you to do what's wrong, pushing you to treat them nasty? It's hard to resist that because it's such a hard pull. How, how can I speak nice to you when you talk so bad about me? How can I say something good about you when all I hear is what you're doing against me? But it is a, such a hard pull. But in spite of that, that poor Jesus said, we've overcome. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. I've defeated it. It can hate you, but it can't win you over. It can dislike you.